All right, we're going to spend some time reviewing the recorded lecture that we had last week uh, before we get into some new materials. I want to point out a few things in Canvas, or maybe one thing in Canvas. Um, well, I'll point out several things. Is Java constructor tutorial? We will talk about constructors today. Um, so, um, be a good one to review. I'll review what I have taught and like to make sure you understand it thoroughly. Java primitive versus reference. Well, we should have time to touch on that today. Uh, but again, you should review that. Uh, and finally, what may be most relevant to you is approaching homework two, which involves a tuition uh, calculation. So I have a little video here about doing uh, calculating. Any of you had a problem with lab two where you had done. to calculate the tuition. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to review with you how the calculation should work and talk a little bit about how you can prevent issues like that from a have an idea on that because it's not as easy uh, as it might look at first. All right, there's there's some catches in there, but review these. Remember, this is a blended course, and we have a lecture one, uh, one one time per week, and there's also materials for you to review online. Well, these are the materials for you to review online today. Okay, or this week rather. Okay, so let's look at this example, this pizza example that we looked at last time. We have two classes in here. We have a unit test and a pizza class, all right? The unit test class, or the pizza class, is exactly as it describes. It represents a pizza. Like any class, it has both attributes and methods. That is, attributes, you can think of those as characteristics. In the case of a pizza, one of the characteristics would be the size of the pizza. Uh, another characteristic would be, um, the kind of crust it has. Uh, a third characteristic would be whether it has pepperoni or not. I think that's the three characteristics we defined. And those are represented in the class by attributes. You see up here we've defined attributes. And we've defined them with having a type. So these two are string attributes, the size and the crust. The uh, has pepperoni is a simple Boolean. We're not going to make a complicated example where you can have a mix of toppings. It's, we, you know, we're a simple pizza shop. We either sell with pepperoni or without pepperoni. All right. Now these are attributes. They're characteristics of the pizza. Pizza is meant to be a uh, sort of a template for making multiple instances of that template. And we call those instances objects. So we have an idea of what a pizza is. We have a concept of what a pizza is. Yet there's many individual pizzas and they have their own combination of size, crust, has pepperoni. These are sometimes called instance variables because there is one of these per instance or per occurrence of this class. You can think of other classes that you might have. Um, in an academic environment, you, there might be a student class, for example, where uh, we have a piece of software that represents a student. And it would have certain attributes and it would have certain methods. And the attributes would be characteristics, like the student number. Every student has a student number, the name, uh, address, phone number, email address, uh, maybe things like, uh, you know, um, where, you know, where they went to high school, uh, what their major is, or maybe they have multiple majors. All right. But they, every student has, or every student has these, or potentially has these characteristics. All right, so when we build a template for that student, we're going to build it with those as attributes. Then there are methods, and in the case of a student, uh, we're going to have uh, methods such as um, enroll in a class, uh, calculate tuition, uh, graduate, uh, drop a class, 
uh, transfer to another college. There's, there's a set of behaviors that a student can have, and those are, are contained within the methods uh, or code of the class. So if we look at this pizza class closer, we notice we have attributes. And we're only interested in this example in three attributes. Now, we could do a better job at this if we wanted to, just starting off. But for now, we're having the size, which is represented by a string, the kind of crust it has, which is represented by a string, a Boolean, which says whether the piece says pepperoni or not. Notice these are declared as private. Um, best practices would be that you would declare the attributes as private or protected. Yes. Say you want to add price in there. Would that be a double? Yeah, if, if you had price in there as an attribute, you would add it as a double. However, price is not assigned to every individual pizza. In other words, if, if I ordered uh, a pepperoni, a small thin crust pepperoni and you ordered that, It'd be the same price. Okay. So because of that, we're not going to make that as an attribute. We're going to have a method to calculate that because we can write rules that says a small pizza costs so much, a medium costs so much. If it has pepperoni, it gets charged so much extra and so on. So that won't be an attribute that you can just set. That instead will be like the result of a calculation. Just like with the student class tuition. All right, if a student is take if a student is an in county resident and they're taking 10 credit hours, they get charged for 10 credit hours for an in, in county student, the same as any other student would. All right. And therefore, it's not an attribute that you would assign to an individual. It's something that's calculated or derived from other attributes. Okay, so when it comes to like student ID, that would be method, right? Student ID, well, we'll talk about that. That'll be an attribute, but it will contain, there'll be methods associated with that. All right. And that's what we have here. We have set methods and get methods. And you're going to have a set and get for every attribute. What is the reason for that? Well, the reason for that is we want to make those private because we don't want the outside world. By outside world, I mean other classes of code to just go in and just set these um, to any value that it wants to. You know, just like, for example, if we had an attribute of, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, if you had a if you had an attribute for student number and it was public, then someone could go in and some method could go in and call and change the a student student number, which wouldn't be a good thing. All right. Now, we're not doing this right now, but the, it, one of the big advantages of doing this via methods is we can have validation. So later on in this class, we're going to have validation here because the size of the pizza could only be what is predefined by the place, you know, small, medium, large and extra large. If you tried to uh, put in, you know, tiny or gigantic or something like that, that's not valid. Well, if you made these public, any other code would be able to put in any values that you want to do here, where in reality, we want to and eventually will have code to validate at this part of there. That way, any, uh, anyone, any other, when I say anyone, I don't mean a person, I mean other, other objects and classes. When they want to set the size, they have to go through this method. And that method will have all the validation and all the checking to make sure that that's a valid value. And it will throw an error if you try to give it a value that isn't one of the valid values. So, so we have for each of these attributes a set method, all right? that other classes can call if they want to change the value of the size of this pizza or the crust type or whether it has pepperoni. We then have get methods that get the value. So all of our sets and gets are going to look like this. Our sets are, are, are void. Void means that um, they don't return anything. We have the name of the function 
and we have the kind of argument it's going to accept. And that argument is going to match the type of the attribute. So this has an, accepts a string argument because size is a string variable. And then we assign whatever the argument is to the value of that uh, of size uh, attribute. Same thing with crust, same thing with Boolean. Now, we need to get back from a class the values, but we can't access these directly, so we use a get method, all right? And uh, the get method simply returns the value. We just want a lot of control over those attributes. We don't want the outside world messing around with them. We want the only way for other classes to manipulate these or get the value of these variables is to use what we have given them in terms of functions. That's why we make the attributes private and we make the functions public. You could have a private or protected uh, function as well, but in general, uh, the functions that we create in this class are going to be public because we want other classes to be able to call them. We don't want other classes to be able to access these directly. Now, uh, you've had C-sharp, right? Okay, in C-sharp, th there's actually, it, it does the same thing, but there's a shortcut for it. If you define something as an attribute and you put that get and set in, in the curly brackets, uh, it generates a, a, it generates code to do exactly this, all right? But that's one complaint about Java, is for Java, if you're writing a Java code, it's wordy because you have to create a get and set for each attribute. Whereas something like C sharp, you just declare it as an attribute and you only need to define uh, a get and set method if it's different than simply assigning it to it, if there's more code involved. All right, we then have other methods. Well, we have one other method. I thought this had two methods. But this method is calculate the bake time. In other words, how long does it take to bake this pizza? And I made this very simple. That if the crust is thin, then it takes 10 minutes to, to bake. Otherwise, it takes 16 minutes to bake. Wow, there's a, there's a pizza place over on the east side called Citizen Pie or something like that, the east side of Cleveland. And they have like these really hot ovens. And it really literally only, 10 minutes that thing would be burnt to a crisp. It literally does it in like five minutes or less. It's amazing. Uh, and our piece is really good, by the way. This is not a paid endorsement, by the way, but if Citizen Pie hears this and wants to give me a few free pizzas, I probably wouldn't turn them down. Anyhow, notice what we have here. And we'll touch it, we'll, we'll explain the reason for this in a minute. But for right now, just know that we're not going to say trust equals then. There are problems when you do things like that. And uh, therefore, we're going to use the equals method to test if this equals that. This returns a true if, they're, if they have the same value. It returns a false if it's not the same value. And we get this assigned. So our class, a template for pizzas. We're saying in our system, these are the things that we're interested about for a pizza. We need to know what kind of crust it has, we need to know the size of it, and we need to know if it has pepperoni or not. Now, we also need to know the bake time, so there's a method to calculate it. Now, again, kind of to your question earlier, could we make bake time an attribute? No, because the bake time depends on other attributes. So we're not going to set for each individual piece, so this one takes 20 minutes to bake, this one takes 15. It's based on the other attributes of the pizza, how long? So it's it, sometimes people call that a derived attribute or a method to do the calculation. Now we don't have a calculate price method here, but we'll do that in a, in a minute here. All right, we'll add the calculate price. Now, this is a module. This will be used anywhere in our system that we need a pizza object. 
So it should have everything about a pizza that we could possibly have. Um, what are some other methods? Well, obviously there, there needs to be able to calculate the price. Uh, maybe we need to calculate nutritional information. How many calories is a small pizza? You know, maybe there is a, uh, maybe we need to know how many slices there are in a pizza. Well, whether they're delivery or not. Now we'll talk about that. You're, you're absolutely correct, whether it's delivery or not. But we're actually going to group pieces together into an order, and then we'll want to know if the order is a delivery or not. So yes, you're absolutely right. That will that will be an attribute uh, in this particular problem. This will be used everywhere we need a pizza, whether we're talking about our ordering system that needs to know how much flour goes into a pizza and uh, to, goes into a crust and how many slices of pepperoni are in a large? And if we estimate we're going to make uh, 500 pieces this week, how much, uh, how much flour, how much uh, pepperoni, uh, how much cheese do we need to order? We could have a system that did that. And if we needed a, a pizza to calculate it, we would use this pizza class. So this pizza class is going to be used everywhere throughout the system, wherever we need a pizza. It's a little component that we're going to drop in. Just like a student class is going to be, you know, students are used in a number of different places. They get put in classes, they get degrees, other things happen, and therefore that student class will be used throughout the system anywhere a student is referenced. Now, with most systems, you're going to have a GUI that sort of is the boss and controls things. Well, <laughs> there's a couple of problems about that. Number one, we haven't talked about developing GUIs, all right? So, yeah, right there, there's, there's a problem. But secondly, developing GUI, a GUI it can take time, and it might not even be our job. There might be someone else developing the GUI. If you think in a large development team, all right, in a large development team, you might put different people on different tasks depending on their skill. So maybe you're a real good Java coder, and your job is to create the classes that other people are going to use. Then maybe you have another person who's a good GUI developer or who is a web developer that's going to create web pages that use these Java classes and so on. So you might not be doing the whole project. You might be doing just a piece of the project. But yeah, you still want to test your piece of the project to make sure it does things right. Okay, that's called unit testing. All right, unit testing is where you test a, a part of a system to make sure that that part is working the way that it's supposed to. All right, um, you know, it's kind of like you take your, you know, if you took your car in and they, they tested the voltage of a battery. All right, um, that's a unit test. They're testing one part of it. They're not testing if the car can drive well or not. They're testing the one part to make sure that it's working. All right. We do that through the use of a test class. And that test class, I usually call the unit test class. Some people, when they do it, they call it lab one, lab two, lab three, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But it has code that is going to test our test code, our, our, our class. So right here I have I create a pizza using the class. All right, what does that mean to create a pizza? What are we doing here? In object-oriented terms, we're creating an object. Yes? How are these two connected? Are they connected because they're in the same folder? Right now, they're connected because they're in the same folder. All right, eventually they'll be connected through the packages that you put them in. In Java, you can put different code in different packages, and then it will know. Like for a larger scale project, you wouldn't have everything in the same directory. You'd create different subdirectories, and those correspond to packages. But they're connected together in our in our simple cases because they're simply in the same folder, right? So here is the template for a pizza. I'll make it a new pizza. What about that new pizza? I'm going to make it size L. 
I'm going to set the crust to thin. I'm going to say it doesn't have pepperoni. I can then call the get methods and the calculate method to see the results. So this first piece of size is, it should say L, crust is thin, does not have pepperoni, and it should calculate the bake time, which because it's a thin crust pizza, ought to be 10 minutes. Here we do most of the same thing, except we only look at the bake time. And this one, we look at the bake time too. Now this one should be 16 minutes and this one should be 10 minutes again, right? So let's compile this and run it and make sure we get the results that we want. So I'm gonna go into the command prompt, bigger. Go to the desktop. Uh, I don't remember my folder. If I do a DIR, it will show me. The folder is pizza after lecture. Here's a shortcut. If I don't want to type out the full name, I could type in CD pizza because there's only one directory called pizza. It will take me in there. I have, it's another subfolder. So I CD again and I do a directory listing and there's my classes. So I'm gonna do my Java compile. So I can type in Java C star dot Java. Okay, that will compile everything that ends in a dot Java. No problems. If I wanna run it, I will run the unit test. The one thing I failed to mention, but is important is that that unit test is going to be the class in our application, our little mini application that contains the main method. Because you have to have one class that contains the main method. So I'm gonna say Java unit test and it runs. The first piece of size is L, the crust is thin, it doesn't have pepperoni, bake time is 10, bake time is 16, bake time is 10. Ideally, I would put more labels there. I would output more stuff to say, this is the first pizza, this is the second pizza, this is the third pizza. Now in this case, I have two test cases, right? I have test case of where the crust is thin, and then I have a test case for everything else. One thing that's, that takes students a little bit of time to get used to is how thoroughly they have to test their code. So in this case, two test cases are enough because there's only two possibilities. It's thin or it's not. It's thin. That's the bake time. If it's not, that's the bake time. Now, when we start coming up with the calculation for price, there might be more variables involved. Depends on what kind of crust there is. Maybe thick crust costs a little more than thin crust. Maybe uh, it uh, depends on the size. A small might cost $8, a medium might cost $10, and a large might cost $12 or something like that. And it might be an extra $2 if you get pepperoni on it. So it, the cost of a pizza then uh, depends on a variety of factors. And to be really thorough, you should test all the possible combinations of those. Now that's a big task, but that's the way to ensure that uh, you, you test your code thoroughly and make sure you've covered everything. You know, it's very, uh, it is very rare when you have code that simply just never works, all right? Any kind of bug that you think of is a bug that results in a certain situation, you know? And, um, you know, 
if you if you think of problems that you've experienced with software, uh, it could be that you run the software one day, you run the software another day, and you get an error. What's the difference? Well, whatever the conditions are, you know. Uh, in a video game, maybe you were playing it on regular mode and you had less than a certain number of points uh, and your health was below a certain level, there's buggy code for that, all right? Very difficult to test. Now there's automated ways that you can test, but we're gonna start out doing the testing manually. All right, one thing I wanna touch on, and I said I'd get back to it, is the difference between a primitive and a object reference. You can tell at a glance whether a variable is a primitive or an object reference based on does the type start with a capital letter or not? All our class names start with capital letters. So therefore, a private string String is S. So a string is actually an object. Now they've done some things to make it easy to use them, but a string is an object. Boolean, though, is a Boolean. Well, yeah, Boolean is a Boolean. Boolean is a primitive, is what I meant to say, because it's lowercase. So we know that. Now, what's the difference between Boolean and a primitive? There's two pieces of memory. Stack and heap, they're called. Now, if I create a primitive, what that does is that sets a place in a stack at a certain point a certain memory location. We'll just make up memory location of 100. And that's where we store the value of that variable, let's say true. And then we know that that variable, that's pepperoni, is in Memory location 100. So if I say, has pepperoni equals true, it's going to go to that memory location, look at the value, and compare it, and it's either going to be true or false. That's pretty much the way you'd expect it to be. The one that's different is an object reference. When I say pizza P equals new pizza, let's say that gets put in memory location 200. So, P points to memory location 200. Now, does the actual data about the pizza goes there? No. The actual data about the pizza object goes on the heap. And that has its own memory locations. Let's say that's 1,000. And therefore, we don't store the value of a pizza because what is the value of a pizza? A pizza has a bunch of values, right? Size, trust type. Uh, and so on. We store the pointer to that object in the variable. So if I simply say something like if P equals P1, it's not going to compare the value in the pizza object. It's going to compare the value of the pointer. 
and you're liable to get misleading results. So let's look at our string example. I've created a trust. That's a string. And let's say I assign to that then. What happens? Well, it's an object. So the, the variable crust is going to be stored as pointing to a location in the stack 100, let's say. And the actual string object is going to get created in the heap. Let's say at memory location 2000. And 2000, the pointer is going to be stored in that location. Not the actual value thin, the pointer to thin. So if I do a comparison and just say if trust equals thin, this is another object that gets created somewhere else on the stack. It's going to compare the memory location on the stack with the other memory location. Maybe that gets put at 3000. And it's going to say those two aren't equal, even though trust does have a value of thin. So because of that, if you're comparing strings, you need to use that dot equals property. To summarize, you always have to be aware uh, and be and realize whether you're dealing with a primitive or an object reference. Now, an object reference, remember that we store in a variable, not the actual data, but a pointer to the data. And that can affect comparisons, probably is the biggest thing that it can affect, but it can affect other things as well. So with object references, we store in the variable the pointer to the data, not the data itself. Because of that, um, because of that, um, the comparison is going to be based on comparing the two pointers, not the value. Let me let me put it another way. In my unit test. I'm going to set that to false. So I set these variables to the same thing for pizza one and pizza three. If I said if pizza one equals pizza three, that statement would be false because these are two separate objects that happen to have the same value. If we're comparing objects, we're looking at that mean that their pointers are the same, that they're pointing to the same object. Not the values of their attributes are the same. Um, for more on this, go over Java primitive versus reference. And it sort of does sort of talks about what I talked about and talks about the stack and the heap and so on. So do go over this example. All right, let's add, <laughs> let's add a method to this to do the calculation. So I'm gonna make up a simple rule about the calculation I'm going to say small equals eight dollars, medium equals ten dollars, large equals twelve dollars. 
if they have pepperoni. It's an extra $12. It's an extra $2, rather. Yeah, that would be expensive pepperoni. It's an extra $2. What about them thick crust? Uh, do we want to charge more? Sure. If we, if it's thick crust, it's also, uh, it's an extra dollar. Okay. So let's write the method to do that. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to keep that up so I can refer to it. And I usually call methods to do a calculation calc something. So I'm going to make it public. It's going to return a double. And I'll call it calc price. Now, that means it's going to return a double. Do I have to pass anything in, into this? No, because we already have these set as attributes. So I'm going to have something like this if declare double for cost, set it equal to zero, or price to be consistent, set it equal to zero. I'm going to have a series of if statements. If size equals small, I'm going to initialize the price at $8. So I'll duplicate this a couple of times. Since has pepperoni is already a Boolean, I can just uh, uh, I can just say if has pepperoni, and that is meant to mean as understood to mean if has pepperoni is equal to true. So I'm going to add my two dollars to the price. I'm going to intentionally make a mistake on this. So if you know what's, what's wrong with it, no spoilers. And extra dollar for thick crust. And we're going to save it. Then I'm going to test it. In the interest of time, I'll just do it for the one. But could do it for the others as well. At price. I made a mistake. Again, no spoilers. I say that so you don't think that I just forgot to do something. I'm going to compile it. Missing return statement on that curly bracket. 
and in line 69. What is the problem with that? Well, here's line 69. It's the very end of that function. The problem with that is I said that this returns a double and I didn't return any doubles. So I need to specify that I want to return price. And now it should compile clean. Now any mistakes in the code I did not intentionally make. Okay. Run it again. Price is $12. Is that correct? A large thin crust without pepperoni, large thin crust would be 12, no extra two, no extra one, so that is correct. Now, how many do we have to test for this? Well, ideally, we would test every combination. So how many combinations are there? There's three crusts, no, there's two crust, there's three sizes, that's six possibilities, and you can have pepperoni or not, that's 12 possibilities. Now, it may seem like a lot of work, it's really just a lot of copying and pasting. And you can make these, you know, you can make the classes and copy the code and paste it and, and have uh, a bunch of them. So, yeah, it's a little bit of work, but, um, you know, it's not that huge of a deal. All right, last thing I want to go over are constructors. Now, remember I drew the heap and the stack up there, and I said when we run certain code, it, it creates something out on the heap. But it creates it empty with no values. A lot of times when we create an object, we want to initialize some values. For example, when we create a pizza, rather than having to run those individual set statements, it might be nice if we could say, give me a pizza, a large pizza, thick crust, has pepperoni. We can do that via a constructor. And constructors look like this. They're public, and it's like a function, but it's not, it's not exactly a function. Its name will be the name, same name as a class. We don't put anything after it, the return value, the return type, because uh, constructors don't return anything. But I can give arguments. So I can say our size, string, our crust, uh, boolean, e, or arg, pepperoni. Pardon me? Has pepperoni. If, if I was going to be consistent, yeah, it should be arg has pepperoni. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, I just I name them the same just so it's easier to match up. Okay. I could name them, you know, X, Y, and Z, but then was X the crust or was Y, or was y the crust, you know? So I, I give them names that are easier to tell. So I will go and say size equals arg size. Crust equals R crust and has pepperoni equals R has pepperoni. So I can create this class on the heap and I can initialize the variables all in one swoop. So for example, here. Instead of calling the individual set methods, uh, 
I can say, give me a pizza and oh yeah, make it, gotta make sure I get the right order. Size cross, so give me a large, thin with pepperoni. So that will, that allows us to not have all those sets. We can just call this and it will create the, uh, the, the class or the object in memory and it will initialize these. So now if we do this, Oh, ah, okay, here's something I forgot to mention. We didn't do any constructors in the first version of this example. But actually there's a constructor that works behind the scenes and that accepts no arguments and all it does is creates the pizza object in memory. Once we define any constructors though, we no longer get this constructor for free. So I'm gonna delete that out. No errors. Price is 14. Large, thin with pepperoni. Yeah, that would be that would be 14. We're going to cover more about constructors in subsequent weeks because, well, that's the idea, the concept of the constructor. There's a, there's a lot of gotchas in the details of constructors. So we're going to take some time to uh, to review that in subsequent weeks. You can actually have more than one constructor. For example, if the default crust of a pizza was thin, you could have a constructor that only accepted the crust and has pepperoni and default the value of the crust to thin. Okay. So you can have multiple constructors on a given object. All right, I'm going to post this to Canvas because uh, I did make some changes to it. Um, that's all I had for today. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, uh, if not, that's all I had for today. Uh, we will see you next week.